this. Taste of the band, no means no. Victoria has nurtured a number of well known music names over the years. Think of David Foster, Nelly Furtado. But in terms of sheer influence, there is an argument to be made that the city's true musical heavyweights aren't so commercial. No means no was a punk band of sorts. They were brought to life in 1979 when brothers John and Rob Wright began playing together at their family home in Victoria. And for the next 36 years, they, along with guitarist Andy Kerr and then Tom Holliston, recorded over a dozen albums and toured the globe. No Means No cultivated legions of fans. And in 2015, they were inducted into the Western Canadian Music Hall of Fame. The band's story is explored in a new book titled No Means No, From Obscurity to Oblivion, an oral history. The author is Victoria radio personality Jason Lamb. And Jason stopped by our studio for a chat. And I started by asking how this project all started for him. How did it all start? Okay, well, I've been a No Means No fan since I was 15 years old. So 1986, uh, going way back. Um, and continued to see their shows whenever I could. I was born and raised in the same hometown as them here in Victoria. Um, and then, you know, if we fast forward to... Around 2018, 2019, I just sort of had this thing kind of going around in my head, like, you know, bucket list stuff. I'd like to write a book one day, maybe before I, you know, go on into greener pastures. Uh, but what would I write a book about? I don't know. I'm not a novelist. I don't have any great ideas for stories. And it just got me thinking, well, no one's ever really written a proper book about my favorite band. No means no. Um, so maybe I should try to see if I can do that. As a fan, I knew that they were... You know, they were coy, they were, they, they eschewed um, attention and, and they didn't, they weren't big fans of, of, of tooting their own horns and stuff like that. Um, and I talked to a guy named Scott Henderson, who used to be the sound guy at Logan's Pub, which is a punk, uh, old punk uh, bar here in town, it's not there anymore. Mm -hmm. And also a legend in his own right, a producer guy that's been around the scene since the late 70s and good friends with these guys. And I knew him, and I said, uh, I got this idea for this book thing. I don't know. What do you think? He's like, yeah, you should you should go for it. Um, meanwhile, I got a hold of another person named Melanie Kay, who had been their publicist. And I said, I'm going to put a proposal together and try to get it to these guys. If I got it to you, would you do that for me? And she said, I'll, I can get it to John Wright, the drummer. Um, but don't hold your breath, because these guys will probably say no, or they might even just ignore you completely. Uh, I said, screw it. I'm going to give it a go anyway. So I got the proposal to Melanie. She sent it in. And then, meanwhile, Scott Henderson actually called up John, the drummer, and Andy, their first guitar player, who lives in Amsterdam, and he said to them, listen, I know you guys are who you are, uh, but if you ever wanted, or if you're ever going to be open to something like this happening, then Jason's the guy that I think could actually do it the right way. Hmm. And that phone call made all the difference in the world. So a couple weeks later, it was literally like three days before the pandemic locked everything down, early March. Um, I got an email from John Wright saying, yeah, I, uh, we got your proposal, and that was it. That was the green light. Yeah. So there's there's the background, really. That started it all. Yeah. I can't yeah. wait to talk to you a little bit more about all the research that went into this. Sure. But let's go back even, even further back okay. for a moment, because I know yeah. that you talk about how No Means No was one of the first live performances you ever got to see That's back correct. as a teenager here in Victoria. Yeah. Was it love at first listen? It was, basically. You know, I mean, it was a long time ago, and there's been a lot of... Uh, <laughs> booze in between then and now <laughs> for memory uh, problems but uh, yeah it really was I'd already I was already starting to get into punk rock by that point um, um, I, I certainly know about the Sex Pistols and the, the Clash and stuff like that even as a young like boy and uh and then the, the Dead Kennedys uh, had an EP called In God Reach We Trust Incorporated. That was the first punk album I ever bought. Um, and then I th think the first show I ever saw was a Dayglo Abortions show with another Victoria band. Mm -hmm. 
And I do remember being at in the auditorium at Oak Bay High, so this would have been grade nine, I think, and somebody played me the song um, Dad by No Means No, mm -hmm. um, which is one of the more recognizable songs for people that in that world. And it blew my mind. I remember going, what the hell is this? It was so dark and, and, uh, and fast and, and hardcore and scary, but then it ended with this really weird, humorous line that I just, I just loved it. And from there, I... I saw them, I believe, the first time. See, I don't even remember the, exactly what the first gig is I saw of, of theirs. I'm pretty sure it was at the FOE Hall on View Street, yeah. which is now Herman's. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah, it was love at first sight when I saw them live. And it was one of those things, and this is a very common thing, is uh, I was like, these guys are old. Like, they just, they had gray hair. You know, they weren't that old. But, yeah. and, and now that I look back on it. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> and then I was a fan, and I remember I waited until the next album... Uh, came out called Small Parts Isolated and Destroyed and I, I bought that album at the record store like yeah. within the week it came out and that, that was it I was fully a fan then and, and, and so may, maybe yeah. this next question is a bit sacrilegious to, yeah. to ask you but, but maybe not because you even talk about how for a lot of people like you acknowledge that No Means No might be the best band that they've never heard of yeah. so, so let me ask you sure. I mean, for the uninitiated out there who, who, who are unfamiliar with yeah. the band how would you describe them? that's a really tough question because um they, they've been all over the place with their sounds and things over the different albums. Um, it's punk rock done by expertly skilled musicians and a guy uh, who writes lyrics, who literally reads philosophy books like dozens of times over and, and is, is really, really like frighteningly intelligent. Mm. Um, so that... W w their music is punk rock, but... It, it it diverts uh, or diversifies into jazz because they're jazz trained musicians, especially mm -hmm. John the drummer. He plays traditional grip, which you know, with the, if you've no drumming, he, he keeps his left hand to its side and drums like a mm -hmm. like a jazz person, which is unheard of in punk rock. And he hits the, the drums still so hard. Mm -hmm. um, but they they even have like they have a lot of funk tinge to them as well. They're a very danceable band most of the time. Um, they're very humorous and very dark. That's, that's kind of how it is. It, maybe that doesn't even sound like a very good advertisement for somebody who doesn't know, but the one thing that's really hard about No Means No to, to get across to people who've never heard of them or who want to dive into their world, it's really hard to figure out what entry points to, to, to give people because there's stuff from No Means No that if I played somebody who'd never heard of them, it would turn them off completely. They'd be like, what the what, what is this? This is awful. I hate it. Turn it off. But it all depends on the person's personality a little bit sure. and maybe even life experience and stuff. So there's not really one album or song that I would say, like, this is what you should listen to the first time you listen to No Means No because it kind of depends on what you're all about. Where you're coming from. And that's weird, I know, but... It's really interesting. Though. Yeah. And when yeah. you talk about that diversity of sound and, and just how, how hard they are to pin down as a certain sound and genre... Mm -hmm. Um, of course, they established themselves here in Victoria before moving to Vancouver. But yeah. how much of an influence do you think the island and Victoria had on on, on who they became? Um, like all of it, it was incredibly important that they started here because Victoria uh, and being on a on an island um, created. And we're talking, of course, way long before you know pre internet pre internet days, pre cell phone days, all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, there was this weird little bubble of uniqueness on the island where things got here a little bit later than everywhere else uh, there was already an established Vancouver punk scene um, and every band in Vancouver I mean this is a generalization but every punk band in Vancouver sounded like DOA at the time because that was the band it wasn't like that in Victoria because they didn't have that direct influence of, of, of something coming through so all of the bands in Victoria in the, in the, in the late 70s but especially the early 80s um, were unique they all had different sounds and they all had different um, personalities and, and, and styles and some of it was really weird and kind of almost inaccessible but uh, something about Victoria the weirdness I mean anybody who's been lived in Victoria for a long time can just tell it's unique here you mm -hmm. know and it still is even in 2024 um, but especially back then there was this strange feeling of isolation from the rest of the world somewhat being on this island which I think fostered a lot of creativity and uh, plus it was a really boring city to live in when you were 15, 16 years old. Yeah. You know, what are you going to do with yourself? You can go get wasted at parties or form a band with your friends. That was yeah. about the options. Yeah.
Jason, tell us a little bit about the research that went into this oral history. Oh, boy. Um, it was a lot. <laughs> Even p fervent fans of No Means No don't know a whole lot about them because of the way that they... the, the arc of their career. They were purposefully... Um, mysterious and they would, would they would put out promo photos that wasn't even pictures of themselves and or they would switch their names up or they would have you know pseudonyms and things like that and so there wasn't a lot to be known but as i got into it once i started the process i knew that i had the the okay from the guys i realized that that none of that was really even that intentional like it was some of it was laziness they just couldn't be bothered some of it was humor they were just trying to be funny and tongue in cheek mm. but i went back and started researching um especially when they were touring overseas in Europe and stuff like that, they did tons of interviews and tons of press and promotion. They were really, they were trying to get themselves out there. Mm. Um, so, so I'm not answering your question maybe, but to, the, the, the research of it um, really just started with, with calling people. So, um, and then every time I would interview somebody, it would lead to sometimes four or five or six more names. Oh, you should really talk to so-and-so, and then I would try to track that person down. Um, weirdly, the, the pandemic benefited me in the sense that everybody was home, mm -hmm. everybody was bored, so I was talking to all these people that would normally be on tour or you know in a studio or busy with their lives, um, so I managed to get a hold of everybody I wanted to, basically, and it just snowballed. I mean, it, it became pretty apparent pretty quickly that I was either going to talk to nobody or everybody <laughs> and, and by the end of the day i think i interviewed over 500 people 500 people uh-huh yeah and what sort of reception have you had towards the book not just here on the west coast but globally well um great so and it's quite new right it's only i'm as we're speaking now i think um it's going to be out in the bookstores this week on the 12th of january i think is the official date that it'll actually be in like places like bowens and monroe's mm -hmm. and stuff like that but um People have it now and have been getting it since before Christmas who have pre-ordered it. And, of course, it's a little bit of insulated because it's all fans. But everyone, I haven't heard a bad thing about it yet, to be honest with you. And I don't want to toot my horn, but it's like people seem to love it. So far, I've only read one actual, like an official review by a publication as opposed to a person or a podcaster or something like that. Um, and that's uh, Louder Than War, which is a UK um, alternative music blog magazine and it was a fantastic review I, I, i'm probably gonna frame it on my wall or something um, so the answer is really good really good feedback and response from yeah. everyone including the people in the book and including the band which is the most important thing to me well yeah. con congratulations on the book and as you say you can you can pick it up pretty soon yeah. at your local bookstore or you can win a copy right now because oh. Jason has so generously brought one with us. I'm going to get him to sign it as well for you. Cool. I like to make our listeners work for the cool prizes that we give away here at All Points yep. West. Mm -hmm. So here's what I'm thinking because I love the story of one of your first live concerts being no means no and really changing, let's be honest, the trajectory of your life in so much. It so really did, especially, especially now looking back with this, exactly. this. This is the biggest thing I've ever done. So it did. It changed my life. Yeah. So here's the question okay. that I'm going to pose to our listeners. If you would like to win a copy of this book, send us an email, allpointswest at cbc.ca, and tell us about a live concert that you had the chance to go to that really, you would say, changed your life. Cool. So if you want to win a copy, send us an email right now, allpointswest at cbc.ca. There's going to be some fun emails to read. I can't wait. Uh, can I get, get to read them, read them to you then? Yeah, okay. I'll send them to you as well. Jason, so great to see you. Thank you so much for doing this with us. Thank you, Jason. I really appreciate your time, man. Actually, uh, awesome. Yeah. Get out there and see live music and support punk rock. That's Jason Lamb, author of No Means No, From Obscurity to Oblivion and Oral History, and of course also a Victoria radio personality. The book is available, as Jason mentioned, as of January 12th. And uh, get those emails to us. Concert that changed your life. All points west at cbc.ca. If you want to be entered into the draw to win a copy of that book and from their landmark album, Wrong, this is No Means No with Rags and Bones.
my blues. 